he wanted to do to the casual, he, she's breathing, but she's unconscious. And responsive. I would maintain, so just to show people from that um, manual inline stabilization here, could I just get someone else to come and take over this for a second? So what I'm going to get you to do, no, I'm just going to explain it to you, just come down. Um, so what I'm going to get you to do is just put two fingers on her forehead, so like with your thumb and forefinger. No, like... Yeah, with two fingers, so thumb yeah. and Sorry. on one hand. One hand? Can you do that? Yep. Oh, right. And two on her cheeks. Okay, now you're going to keep that exactly <laughs> still. And you're going to say, I've got control. I've got control. Yep, yeah, so then I can let go and, and Emma's got control there. And then I come and do the same. I've got control. And then you take over the mill. So, but make sure your hand's around the ear. Don't cover the ear so that if she does come conscious and she can hear. Now we're in a safe position here for for the assessment. So you'd be looking for abnormalities more than anything. It's not just thinking a thing, isn't it? Yeah. Go for the individual. You've not got <coughs> you know, with a conscious person it's a lot easier because they can tell you that's sore. And um, so you're not wanting to overly, you know, press. You're going much more on feel. And um, things like the pelvis do not put too much pressure through that because if there is an injury and they're unconscious, they can't tell you that's really sore. So just feel for instability there. Um, and yeah, and just if there is any abnormalities, you deal with that because they're unconscious, you have consent to work on them as well. Am I right in saying that? It's a tricky area, but we're not going to go into it, which is why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if, we're, <coughs> if they are conscious, then you have to ask, are you okay for me to, to work through this? So you're basically checking for any, any obvious fractures, breaks, anything like that. Yeah. Okay, if you're if you're happy that everything's okay, if you're happy that her neck is okay and you're happy to roll recovery position, you can demonstrate it. Yeah. So Before you roll the recovery position, what you do is you check for any big earrings, check for any rings, any jewellery that might be a problem. Because Katie's about to roll Hannah towards her, which means she's gonna, Hannah's going to be lying with her face on that hand. So if she had any big like rings with big stones in them, just rotate them around so the stones to the inside of her hand, because she's going to be lying like that in a minute. Okay? And it's just so she's not got a big diamond sticking in her face, because that can be quite painful after a while. And similarly, if she's got any watches on or something like that, it's going to be in a road. You can take them off, okay? When you're doing the pat down there, if she's got any big bunches of keys or anything in her pocket, you can take them out and lay them beside her. We're going to talk about all the different problems that that might um, present to you in a, wee, in a wee minute. But you're just making sure that when you roll this casually over, she's going to be rolled over so that she's comfortable as well as being safe. Okay? So we're going to do it a step at a time, yeah. okay? The hand nearest to you is going to go in what we call the how position. Right, so the elbow bent at right angles. All right. The other hand is going to come across her chest. And the back of her hand is going to go against the casualty's cheek. Now, what Katie's going to do is, because if this was really unconscious, if this, I'm sorry, Hannah. Yeah. If Hannah was really she unconscious, she would like just that. flop away again. So what you've got to do is this. Her hand's there. You've got to hold it with your flat palm against her face. Okay. <laughs> so Katie's hand now will not move until the position, until the move's finished. Then what Katie's going to do is lift the far away leg. Stop there. Did you notice the way she done that? You lift it on the other side of the leg. Yeah. Why? Because you keep your hand, your hand there, and then you can roll down straight over. The and side. the other thing is this, and this is one of the things I want to pick up on, right? Is that particularly if you're a chap, right? If you've got a female casualty, and you're doing all this kind of patting and touching and stuff, right? You need to protect yourself against anybody seeing that and thinking, "Oh, you're up to there." So keep your hand on the outside of the leg and just lift the outside of the knee, okay? You didn't want to be slipping your hand down between a female casualty's legs. You just didn't want to do that, okay? So Katie's hand still holding Hannah's hand flat against her cheek, and you just gently pull her over, okay? And then you can bring this leg forward just to stabilize her. And then last thing you do is you just put that head back again on the hand, which Hannah's conveniently done for you, <laughs> okay? In that way, the, now the reasons for doing this, give Katie a round of applause, thank you very much. Uh, so Katie, I'm going to use you again in a minute, okay? Because your expertise is awesome. Right, Hannah, thanks for that. Give Hannah a round of applause as well. What? She thinks she's going away. She's going to wind down in a minute. Yeah. Um,
Like the advantage is, you need to know this, okay? So again, I'll put it in the video if you need to know this, right? The advantage is the recovery position of this. And when the casualty is in the recovery position, the main thing is, if they throw up, right, when they're unconscious, it'll just run out and away from them, okay? If their head's open, it'll just run down their hand and away. So they're not gonna choke on their own vomit, okay? The other thing it does is it stabilizes them. So you can go, if you've got multiple casualties, you know she's stable, you know she's breathing, because you've checked that. You can nip away and check other people, but you keep coming back and checking her. But she's stable, that's the main thing. And the third thing is, um, it actually relieves the pressure in the chest. If you lie on your back, you've got an awful lot of muscle and stuff lying on top of your lungs, and it's quite heavy to breathe if you lie on your back. But if you've rolled the casualty onto their side, you relieve the pressure off the chest. It makes it easier for them to breathe. You'll need to know that. If you think the casualty, and this, this sounds counterintuitive, if you think your casualty's got some busted ribs, all right, you roll them onto the busted ribs, which sounds mental, right? But the reason for doing it is this. If Hannah's got smashed ribs on one side, and this side's good, right, and I roll her onto this side, right, this side, might the lung might be knackered. There might be punctures in the lung because the ribs need ripping, right? So if I roll them to this side, this lung now won't work as well because it's under pressure of Hannah's body lying on top of it. So what you do is you lie up, you <coughs> roll onto her broken ribs so that this, the one lung that's working can still work well. Is that what you've been taught? Yeah. When I was taught that, it just seemed counterintuitive. It seems wrong. So if your casualty has got, you suspect it's damaged ribs or something, you roll it onto that side, right? And she wakes up to be howling. I hope it never happens. Um, is everybody happy with that recovery position, that routine for putting the recovery position? You roll the casualty towards you because that way you've got much more control of them coming across, okay? Remember, keep that hand flat against their hand because otherwise their hand will ball up, right? And then you've got this pressure point on their face and that can stop blood flow and stuff going to their face. Does that make, make sense? Are you happy with that? Yeah. Cool. Right, so, um, the risks of first aid I spoke about very briefly. When you're doing first aid, and you mentioned consent, and Katie was bang on, okay? When you approach a casualty if they're conscious, you need to say to them, are you okay for me, and can I help you out here? Get consent from them. If they're unconscious, you can assume consent, right? Because if you don't, they could, they could die, right? Um, provided you follow all your regulations and all your training and all the kind of stuff that you've been taught in first aid, provided you follow those, then you can't really be called into question. If you're doing things for the right reasons, you do it the way you've been trained, you should be perfectly okay. I'm not aware of any cases where somebody has had first aid done on them and they've tried to put in a claim against the first aider in any way. I'm not aware of it, okay? But wherever possible, you should have <coughs> consent to be working that casualty. If they're unconscious and can't give it, you can assume it and, and, and do what you need to do. Does that make sense? It's a bit of a ropey one, that. Um, and the safety thing, um, this is for everybody, but I suppose it's mainly for chaps. Shouldn't say that, but it is. Um, just when you're doing first aid, if you can have, if there's people that are watching you, great, because that way your back's covered, right? If you're doing first aid and you're patting somebody down and all that kind of stuff, do that secondary surgery and there's nobody there and the casualty comes round, you might get hell of a fright and wonder what you're doing, you know, because they're, they're not aware of what you're doing. So just be aware of it. If you can, try and have somebody there watching what you're doing so you know you're covered. Does that make sense? <coughs>